it's Lisa from Been There Got Out and tonight we are having our old friend and collaborator uh, Brian Packpour from California. He's an attorney, uh, family lawyer, divorce attorney and let me see if he's here yet and we're going to talk about a very popular topic which is babies and infants and pregnancy and uh, parenting plans. Okay. Oh, he's here. Let me try this again. All right. One second. Brian, I invited you. Just join and then we're going to get started. And it's just, this is close to my bedtime. No, not really, but it's you're three hours behind me. And I'm like exhausted and you're probably just like wow. ready to go. Yeah, that's a shame. I'm sorry that you're so tired. No, it's been a crazy busy day and then I just went out to dinner. And I was like, I got to get back. Like I got to finish this conversation and get back home. Yeah. So, so I'm full. I didn't have dessert, but that's okay. It's probably better. Oh yeah. And then you get the sleepies. That's, that's what happens to me. <laughs> yeah. Dinner. Yeah. So, um, so Brian, thanks again for coming on. I don't know if you know, but uh, I just did a blog today and it was based on one of a part of our last conversation because you seem to be such an expert on relocations and parenting plans. So as I was doing it, I was like, there's a whole thing in here that I have a little bit of information on that I want to know more to do another blog on, and that's infants and parenting plans. We were talking a um, couple, whenever we just talked recently, um, you said that that's also one of the most popular questions that you get, especially on TikTok, right? Yeah, definitely. I get a lot of parents ask me, uh, you know, because I'll put on information about a parenting plan and then in the comments, I'll get a lot of questions like, what about, what about, and one of them will be, what about, you know, for an infant? What about for a baby? What do I do for that? So, yeah. yeah, I get a question quite a bit. Good. Yeah, I knew you were the person to ask. Okay, so for the people that haven't seen you here before, can you just briefly introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Brian Packpour, and People online know me as Bri the Family Guy on TikTok. Uh, I don't really, I, I republish some of my content on Instagram, but I don't, uh, most of my Instagram content is just my family stuff. Um, so you're welcome to to follow, but he's gonna get pictures of uh, me and my kids going to like the pumpkin patch and stuff. Um, right, but TikTok's your big informational education. Yes, yeah, TikTok's my outlet. If I had more time, I'm sure I'd, I'd broaden that, but that's it. So. I've been a family law attorney for uh, about 10 years, and, um, and I've, I've focused almost completely uh, on family law that whole time. That's all I've been practicing. It's all I ever wanted to do. It's what I went to law school to do. It's what I enjoy doing, um, so I get very excited about doing it. And uh, so, yeah, it's what I do. And I'm Good. here in uh, uh, Yolo County, California, uh, Davis, California, home of UC Davis. And that's uh, about 20 minutes from Sacramento. All right, excellent. Okay, so um, I know in one of our, our, maybe our last live, I can't remember which one it was, we talked a little bit about pregnant women and there was something about, oh, you know, if you're pregnant, at least in the state of California, you can, you can move and not have to worry uh, about anything happening. But since that conversation, there's been the overturning of Roe v. Wade. So I was gonna say if someone's, um, trying to separate from their partner and they're pregnant, how does that affect them, not just traveling, but wanting to relocate? Right. Well, there's nothing in the Dobbs decision that changed, which is the decision you're talking about. There's nothing in Dobbs that changed the, the constitutional right to travel, meaning that you can go from any state to any state and, and not be um, stopped from doing that and not being able to enjoy all of the rights and privileges that you would in any other state. Uh, or any of that, or, or make your make yourself, um, uh, or, or that state has to make available the same rights and privileges to you that it would to the individuals that, that live there. So there's nothing in um, Dobbs that changed any of that. So, uh, so you can still do that um, if you are pregnant with a child um, and uh, you want to move as I've advised many people in the past, and I've done a couple of videos on TikTok about this, then the time to go is when the child is in utero. Y you should go, you should leave. Uh, there, it, it's, there's nothing stopping you. There's no law that can stop you. There's no order that can stop you. Um, there's no judge that can make an order to keep you from leaving. 
you are allowed to go. There's nothing that can stop you. Okay, so let's say, and we just got a question that I saw like 20 minutes ago. Someone said, what about if a couple has a newborn and they live 60 miles apart? So let's say the woman moved and relocated when she was pregnant and now there's this new baby, like how does that affect a, a visitation or parenting plan? Right, so 60 miles apart is hard. It's, it's difficult. I had a case um i still have the case actually i've been i've been in this case since the kid since around the time the kid was born and now the kid's like five years old i think they're in tk and um they uh they're about four hours apart um and it really just depends on how much of an effort both parents are willing to make in order to assure that that child is a part of both individuals lives in terms of providing transportation uh opening themselves their own homes up to and 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 uh financially what they're able to do um but ideally for a 60 mile difference that's not well depending on what 60 miles that is 60 miles in la versus 60 miles in omaha are, are a little different uh but as, as assuming it's it's a basically as the crow flies i would just say there's there's no reason that the the father in that scenario can't visit at least a few times a week uh, to make a 60 mile drive. People do that commute for work 60 miles a day. So um, so a few days a week, maybe Saturday, Sunday, and another weekday and come and visit with the infant child uh, for at least a couple hours, um, maybe two to three hours. Um, and then depending on what you feel comfortable with, that could be in the home with mom there, or it could be out at the park or indoors if the weather's not, um, uh, suitable for that. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna remind you because I'm sure there's people screaming right now that our audience <laughs> is domestic a lot of domestic violence things. Right. So, so that let's say typical situation, there's a restraining order. They left because of domestic violence, and right. there's no way that they want this other person, male or female, in the same home. And they 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 moved far away to get away from the person. How does that right. change? Well, then obviously there's going to be other um, other qualifications to that. So uh, number one, there might be um, supervised visits uh, that are made part of that. So then you might have, uh, and, and then supervised visits, there's tip two kinds. There's professional supervised visits and then there's non-professionally supervised visits. So uh, professionally supervised visits, which is more of the gold standard, is you would have an independent third party who is a paid individual who would come along for the visits and they would supervise them so and the the frequency and duration of those visits can be the same it can be a few times a week although it gets expensive when you're talking about supervised visits so um uh the but you can you can have that and the you would drop off the baby to the supervisor and then the supervisor would meet up with the other party all safety protocols would be observed in terms of um transportation etc um, and, um, and, and therefore the visit would be safe as you have this independent person who can supervise it. Sometimes people do non-professional supervised visits and that, especially with a baby that makes things a little bit more flexible, which is, you know, that you need to be more flexible when it comes to a baby. So a fit member of the family that you trust, like the, maybe it's the father's mother, uh, it's, you know, it's paternal grandma, paternal grandpa, a paternal aunt. Um, or maybe it's somebody in the mother's family who gets along well with the father. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm using gender, I'm being gender specific, but that's typically the scenario that we have, but it could work the other way around if you flipped it. So those are some ways that you could do it. Uh, I know feeding is a concern, so that's why, you know, the younger the child is, the duration is going to be shorter. Maybe it's only an hour to start, uh, and maybe that's not a bad idea because, um, uh, you're not even sure if, if dad even has any idea how to take care of a baby for an hour. Um, so uh, that may be something that they need to warm up to um, or maybe take a parenting class, which sometimes the courts order as well. Yeah, so we actually had something earlier with the client who they have a baby and the father is doing supervised visitation and he only did a couple, but then um he didn't change the diaper properly and then you know and so the the mother was very concerned that he didn't he, he's now pushing to get um unsupervised visits 
but that he doesn't know how to change diaper. He doesn't know how to take care of the baby. And I was wondering about like, at what point do you see people do what's possibly like a step up where they get more time either unsupervised or the, yeah, or maybe overnights. How does that work? Well, um, and, and the this, this step up can be something that happens from the get go or it could be step up in terms of you just keep going back to court and the court keeps stepping it up as it sees progress. Uh, but you can go from, for instance, you know, an infant child where you have an hour a day for a few days a week to two to three hours a few days a week to uh, after the child is, you know, three months old to when they're six months old, having an overnight um, maybe from Saturday to Sunday and then a couple other days a week where you're with the child for a couple hours. And then uh, maybe when the child's even one years old or a little bit um, older, having a whole weekend um, and, and maybe seeing the child again. So uh, it's all about, you know, starting out with, you know, in, in when the child is younger, the younger the child is, um, uh, frequency is more important than duration because your child can't hold their attention. You know, I have, to, I have two children. So I, I've read the books. I, I know I, ch kids can't hold their attention for more than a few seconds anyway. So a one hour visit is more than enough to imprint yourself on that child. And what you really want are frequency. See, so you, you want that child's brain to see you Monday and maybe Wednesday and Friday and maybe Saturday too, even if it's only for 15 minutes. Um, and, and then as the child gets older, now duration starts to become more important, so. Interesting, okay. So, and this was another question that uh, we got this morning when I posted your video about uh, typical newborn parenting plans. Um, somebody said that the World Health Organization recommends two years of breastfeeding. And I know when my kids were little, I did exclusive breastfeeding for two years at, at least, and I didn't um, pump at all. So let's say that I had been getting divorced during that period. Like what impact would someone who's exclusively breastfeeding have on a difficult <laughs> divorce situation? Like if, if I were trying to build my case and it was like my kid is only breastfeeding, certainly they started eating solid food after a few months trying right. stuff. But, but the breastfeeding part, you know, there's health benefits, there's all kinds of things. Like, yeah. what do you recommend well, for someone in that situation? Because we have clients that are breastfeeding exclusively and they are just heartbroken with yeah. having to give the baby for overnights. Well, first of all, um, you know, as much as they, people love to talk about what the World Health Organization and other uh, studies show about the benefits of breastfeeding, what they forget is all the studies that show the benefits of having two involved parents in a child's life, which can oftentimes be even far more important than the benefits of breastfeeding. And second of all, all of the studies that have shown those benefits of breastfeeding, and there's a really good article in the New York Times that showed that none of those benefits were able to, were able, they were none of them accounted for the differences in things like socioeconomic status, family status, and things like that, that um, chances are if a child is breastfed, it's being breastfed um, oftentimes by educated parents who are, are already going to have the, uh, the, the background and the uh, structure so that child can go on and have a successful life, can afford college, et cetera, et cetera. And none of the studies actually correct for that yet. We don't actually have definitive data that medically, specifically, that breastfeeding itself has far and away benefits above formula. That being said, I, I, trust me, I'm a big proponent of breastfeeding as well. That was the, the go-to for, um, for my ex-wife and I. And we wanted to do that. We wanted to have um, our child, children breastfed as long as they possibly could. Um, however, um, there's, it's, it's all a balance. That's why the scale, whenever you think about the legal system, it's all scales, right? It's okay, breastfeeding, but okay, other parent. Um, how do we balance this out? And so you're gonna be able to keep that child exclusively bre breastfed um, much better if you're able to pump better. Um, if you can pump and provide a supply for the other parent to take with them. Um, but if the child gets to six months, 12 months, and the other parent is, is actively involved, there's no other concerns about domestic violence and drug use and alcohol and, and health safety and welfare issues. Um, all things being equal, the court's going to be like, okay, we need to start balancing this out. And if you can't pump, 
and you can't provide enough, then we're then then I'm going to make it okay for for um, in that case probably dad or uh, uh, or if it's same sex partners or whatever to supplement um, mm -hmm. with formula because uh, we're getting to a point now in the child's life where um, breastfeeding is important and I respect that, but also as important as the relationship with the other parent. And not only that, but just because they uh, are having some formula doesn't mean we're ceasing breastfeeding. Like you can still breastfeed the child when they're with you, but for a few hours a day for them to be with the other parent or a half a day or an overnight for them to be able to sub well have a formula. Again, I'm not, I'm not advocating for either of those positions. I'm just no, telling it's you, really good. Yours, it's, these are the yeah, expectations the judge is going to have because they have to, they have to weigh these concerns you have with the valid concerns that the other parent has, which is that I don't want to be a part of this child's life. You guys couldn't make it work. Okay, you guys couldn't make it work for your intact family. That would have been beautiful, but it didn't work. So now you're asking a stranger in a black robe to be fair to both of you and your child, which is really important. And one of those things is to make sure your child has a relationship with both parents. Right, because that's one of the top custody factors. I'm so glad that you had that answer. And I know it's very hard to hear for a lot of um, breastfeeding parents. Like I, I, I would have had a really hard time with it, but I understand because of that one of the top custody factors is encouraging the relationship with the other parent, not just saying the baby's or the child is, is mine. And we talked yeah, about that and, in the past too. And look, I talk on I'm a lawyer, right? So I, I represent both sides of this case. I've had the dads in these cases. I've had the moms in these cases. And trust me, I've argued, I've, I've gone, I've, I'm on the five yard line on both sides of this field. I've, I've, I've pushed it as, in both directions. So I totally understand how people feel on both sides of that argument. And I'll make that argument for them when they hire me. But at the end of the day, the, the judge is on the 50 yard line trying to be like, ah, I gotta make sure the playing field's at least a little equal uh, to make sure this is all fair. And again, their focus is the child. Can I make sure, yes, I want them to be healthy physically, but I also want them to be healthy emotionally and to have two healthy, involved parents in their lives. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Okay, so again, oh, before I jump to the next thing, we, you were telling me the other day about how um, breastfeeding is sometimes, well, I call it weaponized. Can you talk a little um, bit about that? With, with well, the yeah, and, and, I've had, and I only say that because I've had, um, I've had, I've had those moms as clients and, and they've confided in me before um, that, you know, that they're using their breastfeeding um, and they're not, they're, the breastfeeding isn't really even that successful but they're using every tool in their, you know, in their toolbox to keep the child from the other parent because they think that's best for the kid. And I think they legitimately feel like it's best for their kid too. I think because of whether it's abuse or, or other factors, um, if they think that breastfeeding can give them an advantage in the family law case in terms of making sure that the child doesn't, and there's also a lot of women, I've had some of these women who feel like, um, no matter what any judge tells them or counselor or certainly no lawyer tells them that um, women are better caretakers of children. Children should be with women, should be with their moms until they reach a certain age. We used to actually have, that was actually codified here in California until the eighties. We called it the, uh, the tender years doctrine. And, and, um, and that meant that for a child's early life, the mom was the favored parent and some States, Maybe that's still the case. I don't know. I'm just here in California, but um, but there are a lot of moms out there who still feel that way, and so they use breastfeeding as sort of that sort of a weapon in their in their toolbox to say like, oh yeah, I'm 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 breastfeeding. They they may 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 not. They may actually be supplementing with formula at home themselves, but when they show up to court, it's it's all about the breastfeeding to make sure that they can limit to the extent possible the time with the other parent. Wow. Um, so that tender years thing went, you said that went through the eighties. What, what made things so change? The early to mid eighties. Yeah. So what happened after that? What, what got rid of that? Equality, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, um, to some extent feminism, mm -hmm. um, but really to some extent, to the most extent, uh, I would say from a, a, a realistic standpoint, it was just about that. That was around the time where women, many more women were entering the workforce. Um, and so it, it, and, and divorce was starting to skyrocket. Women were starting to become more able to support themselves. So why stay with this in this unhappy, maybe even, 
abusive uh, marriage. And so I'm going to get out and I can work. And so if I can work and I can get out and they can work and they're already out, um, why not have it so that there is no favoritism in terms of uh, uh, custody for the children? Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Okay. So um, we just got a question that I, that I noticed and uh, it's, it's a question that's come up a lot. Like what if, the other parent has mental health issues or drug abuse or some kind of safety issues. Like at what point would say supervised visitation or like, how, how do you know when it's okay? Like how, how do you know when a baby is old enough to be safe or what do the courts look at with, with, with factors like that? Well, they would do an about, you know, if you're going to make these allegations, typically the court's going to, uh, want to have some kind of evaluation, some some type of investigation into these claims because these are just the claims of one parent. Right. If the other parent doesn't full fledged admit to everything, then the court kind of throws up his hands and be like, "Well, I don't know that they are mentally unwell. I don't know that they have a drug problem or alcohol. Are there is there any evidence of that? You know, so you know, for instance." Uh, uh, if there's alcohol allegations, you know, did they have a DUI recently? Do you want to go to trial and put on, we, we can have a short evidentiary hearing where I can put on friends who can testify that he commonly um, drinks and drives or, um, you know, or maybe have a mental health evaluation of that individual and see what comes out of it. So there's lots of different mechanisms and sometimes it can be a little bit expensive, uh, for individuals trying to prove these things in court. But obviously all those things would have an impact on the parenting plan. If the court finds that those things are true, then they're going to um, do things to, uh, in, to ensure that the child is safe. Um, you know, before you ever get to best interest, people talk about best, best interest standard. Before you ever get to the best interest standard in a family law case, the first thing the judge is mandated to do is to ensure the health, safety, and welfare of a child. So if there's any allegations involving domestic violence, severe mental health issues, drug and alcohol problems, they have to deal with that first before they get to the mental health issue, before they get to the best interest uh, standard. So, okay, so let's say that there's findings that it's true and they have a baby. And of course, the other one who's got the issues is like, but I still want to be involved with the kid's life. Like, and I want to revisit this. Like, when could they go back and try to revisit? Like, what... What are some of the custodial factors or things that might change where it's like, okay, you had this in the past. Now you want more time. Like how long would someone have to wait or how would they have to prove that now they're fit? Well, I guess it depends on what the finding was. So if it was, um, if it was domestic violence, for instance, I mean, here in California, we have some very clear guidelines uh, when it comes to domestic violence. If you prove abuse, uh, then you look to family code section 3044, which I talk a lot about a lot, 3044B, A is the one that says it's presumed you can't have custody of your child if you've been shown to be abusive to your intimate partner. B is the one that tells you, okay, well, what, what do you do? And it has a bunch of different things in there like um, parenting classes, following the current court orders, uh, going to um, treatment for alcohol if that was the problem, or substance abuse uh, classes if that was the issue. Um, going to a 52-week batter's intervention program. Um, so it has all these different things uh, that you do. And then you come back to court. And if you show that, then you likely get that rebutted. When it, if it was just a straight-up mental health issue, then it might be getting an evaluation done by a counselor to say they're good. Uh, or alcohol, get an alcohol evaluation done to say that they're, you know, there, I, I'm confident that they're, you know, that they have it under at least, you know, uh, control right now. So it really just depends on the problem and the severity of the problem. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that, that makes sense. I know, you know, this is hard for a lot of people to stomach, of course, because they feel like it happened. That's the kind of person they are and it's not going to stop and they hide it. They, you know, people put on their best faces for the court. They try to say, I've, I've done everything I have to do and then still... Yeah. You know, there's safety concerns. Um, I totally get it. And I understand there's a lot of people out there. But I mean, just as many people as there are like that, though, I have plenty of people I could show that uh, have reformed, have turned their lives around, have really? uh, wow. become very 
different people in their lives. Um, and, uh, you know, they saw the light or whatever, they were able to do it. I think sometimes, well, it could be all kinds of things that, that does it to people, but, um, but I've seen lots of people change. Um, not everybody, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, us too. Like I'm thinking, uh, you know, we have clients who have been like serious drug addicts and alcoholics and have other issues too, and they have changed. Yeah, I had a client who was hooked on meth, committed serious domestic violence, um, didn't see his child for, I think, about the first two years of his life, and then worked his way up to supervised visits, uh, then to unsupervised visits, then to every other weekend, uh, to suddenly being the primary parent. And now he has sole custody of his child. Wow. Because the other parent in that case, as he was going uphill, she was going downhill. And um, so time, you know, uh, and, and, and that didn't even take that long. That was four years um that all took so uh things change in people's lives they do yeah yeah okay so there was another question um about uh work schedules so when somebody and this this comes up a lot with our clients too is the other parent wants to make a parenting plan centering around their work schedule and it changes every week yeah that's what, difficult. What yeah it's it's really hard um to um to to do that i mean to have a schedule that changes every week would be something that would require both parents to get along really well to make that work um the court's not really going to make you they're not going to make one parent change the schedule every week now there are i had a case one time where a guy was a cop and he the plans were well defined so it was like i'm either on this schedule the mm -hmm. like the graveyard the the regular day schedule and then like the 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 evening schedule or whatever and what they came up and and it was never like day to day it was always like three months at a time three months he's on this schedule three months in a, so the one thing the court did in that case was came up with a plan so this is the parenting plan for the three months he's on this schedule this is the parenting plan and then every time the schedule changed they switch it was actually the other person that was the cop i had mom and i was fighting against it because my client hated it but um, but the judge, um, you know, ruled against us. So, um, uh, in fact, in that case, I had a scenario that I know a lot of moms, probably, uh, some of your followers hate what, uh, and I, and I understand why, but, um, you know, where cases where sometimes because dad works, uh, and I'm going to say dad, I'm sorry that I'm using specific genders, but, um, uh, because dad works, stepmom is at home or has a more flexible schedule with her job and can sometimes fill in some of the gaps. So mm -hmm. she takes the kids to school and maybe picks them up, but dad gets home, he's there at night, he's helping with homework, he's doing dinner, he's doing bad time and bath time, he's there on the weekends and stuff, but there's a few hours here and a few hours there where stepmom needs to fill in. And I have a lot of moms who are like, that's not her job, that's not what she's to do. If he can't do it, if he can't be there for every waking hour that the kids are there, he shouldn't have that time. I've made that argument before and I've, I've lost every time I have. So um, you can keep making it, but it, it doesn't usually fly. Now, certainly if he's handing off all of his parenting time, if he's not around at all, that's, that's a different story, but yeah. Yeah, I was gonna ask you about that because I'm thinking of one client in particular where um, the father has fought really hard for 50-50 custody, got it. The judge even said, you are not to go back to the crazy work schedule because now you have 50-50 and he did and he's, he has a nanny for like everything. Right, So right. the kids so are not infants. I just figured I'd throw that in there and see what you think about that. Yeah, that's, that's a little different. So if he's, he's not gonna be around at all and, um, and sort of, and also just I'm sure the court doesn't appreciate getting twisted around like that, being like, well, you, you sort of painted this nice picture and then as soon as you got the orders you wanted, you changed it all up. That's, that's quite different. But like I said, I think having someone at home, even and, and if it's a stepdad or stepmom, filling in some of the gaps, what the court, the court, the way the court looks like it typically is like, look, they, they do their thing at their household. You do your thing at your household. They're managing their household. And the kids, the kids are usually fine. They're like, they're, and again, that's what the court's focused on. It's not fairness to mom or fairness to dad. It's like, do the kids get along with stepmom? Yeah, the kids are doing great. Well, then she fills in for a couple hours. That's awesome. Then, then that way dad has more time. 
The alternative would be like dad becomes an every other weekend parent. And that's not what we want. If dad can be a week on week off or, you know, 50, 50 parent, but for these few hours here and there, it, it works out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about embryos. Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> so we mentioned this, but just a little bit, cause I'm going to, I'm going to have sure. an embryologist on in a, a few weeks, but so. Oh, okay. I'll probably listen to that one because I, 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 they, they might know more than I do. I know. Can you imagine? It was like a crazy coincidence because we have a client who's dealing with embryos and wondering what to do. And then like two days later, I met in person an embryologist and he was like, oh, I'll talk about that. Yeah. So, but you have had some experience with embryos. So some, someone has IVF and yeah. um, they don't use all the, the embryos and, or they don't use the eggs and then, and then they have them in storage. So how does that affect a parenting plan? Yeah, it's, it's difficult. Um, well, the parenting plan itself, there's, there is no parenting plan, right? Because the kid's not here yet. Yeah. Um, so it's not so much about parenting plan, but just deciding what do we do with these embryos? Right. Uh, people are disputing them. Uh, the, the, it's, it's still, it, it, believe it or not, I mean, here we are 30 years into this um, ability to do this. Um, and we still don't have real clear law. We have some clear laws about, um, you know, if you use um, uh, assisted reproduction, what does that do in terms of parenting rights? You know, if you if I supply the the goods, can I be held later to be the father? No. If you use an assisted reproductive uh, facility with a contract and everything, no, I can't be determined to be the father. Um, uh, whereas if you use the, uh, let's say the at home kit, um, you, there might be less protection, although that's even changed a little bit. So we have clear laws around those things, but what we don't have clear laws around is, okay, what, let's say, um, the materials have come together and you have an embryo, um, and mom and dad, uh, or, or, you know, it's sometimes it's same sex relationships, right, same sex right. relationships or, uh, uh, what have you, they're getting divorced. Who keeps the embryos? Um, here in California, the typical outcome in most of these cases is that whatever the contract with the facility says, that's what you do because you, you had an opportunity to review that contract and had an understanding at that time, what you would, would do. And so that's typically what controls. And there's usually a box that you check that says, we agree that these will be destroyed upon divorce. Um, and so that's what would happen. But you could agree to other things. You can agree that, you know, they'll be given to one person or the other. Um, or some, I think one of the box says, you know, whichever one wants to actually bring them into uh, the world or what have you. So um, uh, there's, so typically the courts in California will respect that, um, whatever the contract is. But courts in other states um, who are a little bit more, um, I guess, just, to put it plainly, they're more on the pro-life side of the political spectrum. They see that as, um, a, 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 you know, tantamount to abortion. So they're going to be more sensitive about it, about coming out with any law or having any judge. And these judges are elected judges in these states. They're not federal judges, which are appointed and have a lifetime appointment. They're elected, which means they can be unelected. And so uh, if they're in a conservative constituency that might be sensitive to this, then oftentimes they've been ruling that, look, which parent is actually going to take care of the embryo and keep it? Um, okay, well, I'm going to give the embryo to that parent. But, it, but despite those sort of technical issues, it's, it's a tough call for any judge because in almost all of these cases where someone is actually going to the MAC to fight for those embryos, to keep them, in almost every single one of those cases, it, that any that I've ever seen, it is an individual who cannot have physically have children on their own anymore. Mm -hmm. um, either it, you know, either it's a same sex couple or it's a mom who probably they did this because they already were told that they could not, um, or they uh, were going in for treatment for cancer or something. And that was going to remove their ability to produce any more eggs. And so this is it for them. Um, and if these embryos are destroyed, they're never having children that are genetically related to them. So uh, it's an emotional issue for, for both sides.
Yeah, I'm thinking like uh, in particular with with our client, they we haven't looked at the contract yet, but she is trying to make a parenting plan. And I'm wondering if like say say she doesn't mention anything about the embryos and she just says that she gets to keep all whatever related to anything reproductive and he doesn't really pay that much attention to it. Would that override the contract that they made with the IVF place, do you think? Like, um, could it be modified or has to be well, you, could, you could definitely agree later. Sure, you could agree. Now, I, I'm not talking about your friend's idea because I don't really know it that right, well. Right, right. And obviously, I don't practice in your state. Yeah. But typically, yes, you can, you can agree in a court order later mm -hmm. after you've signed that contract what to do with the embryos. Um, and that would likely supersede, just like the judge themselves making the order, uh, superseding the contract, you could agree a stipulate through a stipulation to override the contract and to do something different with the embryos um, later. But the, the reason um, that so many, I think the reason for most men, especially that are so um, hesitant on allowing someone to keep the embryos are, is really twofold. One, I think most men you meet on this issue will tell you it's kind of weird that like there's going to be this you know, there's, there might be a kid someday that I don't even know. And I didn't even have any say in whether they were brought into this world. And they're basically my son or my daughter. That's kind mm -hmm. of bizarre. But other, the other thing that sort of makes this even more difficult is you can't agree your way out of, spout, out of child support. Mm -hmm. you just can't. And so even if you could agree with them on paper and say, okay, look, I'm going to keep the embryos, but I'm never going to come after you for child support. I'm never going to do it. I promise. I promise. I'm never going to do it. No court in the world is going to uphold that agreement. You could just change your mind as soon as the child's born and say, I need child support. Court's going to give you child support. So wow, I think yeah. most people have no idea that that's the case. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, and, 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 that, and that's in every state. There's, there's no way to agree your way out of, you can agree to set child support to zero dollars, but that doesn't mean that's going to be for all time. Six months right. later, change your mind. I'd like right. some child support. And that's just to make sure that children always have support. Just because uh, one parent might agree that that's the best thing for the kid today. If that's not the best thing for the kid six months from then, then the, the state has to step in and say, no, 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 this kid needs financial support. Wow. Well, good to, good to hear from an attorney that that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so another thing, um, so we talked about relocating when someone's pregnant, which seems to be easy, but say someone just had a baby and then they wanna get a relocation and there's domestic violence. Yeah. How hard is it? Because we know relocations tend to be kind of difficult, right? Yeah. Is it uh, harder if there is an infant, because and, and not like 60 miles, but say, a, a halfway across the country. Someone really wants to move halfway across the country with the baby. Yeah, uh, it, it's hard. Um, and, you know, the, because, and I've had a string of these relocation cases where they, they're relocations in the context of an already difficult parenting plan. Right. Um, and in that case, you already have an infant and you want to move across the country. How in the hell? is the other parent ever going to develop a relationship with that child? I think most people, when they think about relocations, they're thinking about their kids being eight and 10 and 12, and the other parent already has a relationship with them, and they're going to be doing FaceTimes and vacations together and et cetera. If you're moving away and that kid doesn't even know who the other parent is yet, or barely does, um, and, and you're moving far away, how is that parent ever going to have a relationship with that child again? Um, and that's something that the court is, going to be is going to weigh really heavily on them. I've had uh, I had a case recently that I just I, I want a relocation on for my client. And it came in the context of dad was trying to um, uh, re re reunite with their daughter, who they did have a relationship with, but then dad disappeared for a couple of years. And then all of a sudden said, Okay, well, now I want parenting time, my client wants to move away. Um, and, um, and of course my client had sole custody. So of course the court granted our, we had to go through a trial, but the court granted it. And now how is he going to, how is he going to reconcile with that child? How's he ever going to have a relationship? They live on the other side of the country now. Yeah. 
Yeah, tricky. Tricky. It's up the baby. I mean, I don't know. You do FaceTimes. You do whatever. Um, the, the, what the court might do in that situation is order you to come back uh, more frequently than you might be comfortable with. So oh, okay. let you go to whatever, Texas. But you got to come back every couple weeks to, or not, no, I'm sorry, not every couple weeks, every couple months. I was going to say, what would that be super expensive? Sorry. Every <laughs> couple of months, you got to come back um, so that the other parent can have a relationship with the job. And they might be like, that's totally unfair. I can't afford that. And that's not, you know, that's the judge would be like, this is you. You want this. I didn't mm -hmm. ask for you to petition to move away. You came here and asked for a petition to move away. I'm telling you what the conditions are. You're going to have to work really hard to make sure that child has a relationship with the other parent. If they're ready to work hard to make sure that the child has a relationship with you, then maybe the child stays here and you can go ahead and go to Texas. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, Brian, is there anything else we should know that's important about babies and parenting plans and <laughs> any uh, last? No, I, I mean, like I said, it, it's it's really just about being flexible. You know, um, again, the more flexible you can be when the child is younger, it's going to make such a huge difference as the child gets older. And I know that's not always easy because of domestic violence uh, and other issues, uh, but it's 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 going to make things so much better. Um, I wish that it's it's so strange to me these people that have children all within the context of a completely destructive relationship. And it's like, how does that even happen? Like, how does that, how does that happen where there's like, uh, like all within that time frame? It's, it's interesting to me, but, um, but to, you know, just accept that your child, it'd be great if they had a couple, two parents and, um, and what can, what can we do to make that happen? Of course, dads, what can they do to make it safe for them? Yeah. Yeah. Good point. All right. Well, thank you so much, Brian. Now I'm like, I have tons of stuff for this blog that I started. Oh from our yeah. last topic and this has been really helpful and we'll get together again on TikTok or something absolutely all right take care good seeing you again all right bye bye, bye.